even though it's September, summer is not over here in the desert. But fortunately, we have moved inside to the house and we are at least working in the shade. In this video, I am going to be talking about cleaning and sealing our exposed concrete floors, installing our interior doors, and how we were able to get a DIY concrete two-story fireplace. I'm Alicia. And I'm Bryce. And we are building a modern house. We're trying. Hopefully building a modern house. <laughs> we want a cool contemporary house and we need a workshop, but we have an impossible budget. So that means we have to get really creative and be prepared to roll up our sleeves and do some of the work ourselves. It'll be hard, but it will be worth it. This video is brought to you by Concreate, the door stud, and presenting sponsor, Simpson Strong Tie. All right, first we have to go back in time. Back about 30 degrees ago, late April, early May, when we had just finished up framing the house. Before we could seal the concrete floors, we needed to make sure all the exterior doors were installed, including the 12 foot wide, eight foot tall sliding glass door in the living room. At this point, all the windows of the house were also installed, so we felt confident that the house was sealed up enough that we wouldn't have to worry about gusts of wind blowing dirt on top of our sealed floor while it dried. I mentioned back in episode two of Building Modern on a Budget that our concrete contractor did a fantastic job. We had previously discussed with him that we planned on sealing the concrete and leaving it, so his crew took extra time traveling and polishing the surface of the concrete. Our slab is almost perfectly flat and buttery smooth to the touch. But even with expert installers, a large slab of concrete like this will still have a few cracks and divots. We went around with concrete patch and a belt sander just to fill any imperfections before we started to clean the slab. We used a power washer, push brooms, and a mild detergent to clean the concrete. You can see as I'm using the power washer exactly why we wanted to tackle the step of sealing the concrete before we got drywall installed. We were pretty diligent about keeping the floors clean while we worked, and we made sure that all the laborers knew that there should be no painting or marking on the floors. Unfortunately, some chalk lines were unavoidable during the framing process. We were happy to see that most of the chalk lines came off easily with the power washer, but I was very sad to see that the chalk lines that we made on the concrete initially, when it was still a little bit green, were pretty permanent. They didn't want to budge no matter how much we scrubbed and washed. Bryce and I did lots and lots of research about removing stains from concrete, and after doing a couple of sample patches in closets, we decided we needed to use the potentially risky technique of using a mild acid to remove the chalk stains. We started by filling a couple of buckets up with clean water, and we added a little bit of baking soda, which is actually an alkaline, so that means the acid would be neutralized as soon as we used the water to clean it up. We used a small spray bottle to apply diluted white vinegar on top of the chalk lines. Immediately after, the second person would scrub away the stain and then use the baking soda water to wash away the vinegar. This technique actually worked really, really well and completely removed almost all of the chalk lines. We only have one or two really faded stubborn spots that wouldn't completely lift out. Right now, I'm gonna make a huge disclaimer. If you have stained concrete and you're thinking about trying the vinegar trick, Make sure you do your research and you try a couple of inconspicuous sample areas. We were lucky that our concrete didn't experience any sort of visible etching or change in texture, but acids are known to etch concrete surfaces, so just be careful. Once the concrete was washed and the stains were removed, we needed to get rid of as much sawdust as we could from the walls and from the ceiling. A leaf blower worked pretty well to divert most of the dust out the doors. And then the two of us spent a good four to six hours with brooms and vacuums and dust mops trying to get every speck of dust off the floor. Finally, it was time to start sealing the concrete. There are dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of types of concrete sealer out there. They all seem to vary about how much square footage they cover as well as their application type. 
We did lots of reading and research, and we decided to settle on a product by Consolidec called Polish Guard. We wanted a product that would at least partially soak into the concrete, not just sit on the surface. Also, we wanted to make sure it was going to be durable against everyday wear and tear and spills, so it needed to be resistant to acids and mild cleaners. I didn't want to worry about my kids spilling a glass of lemonade and completely destroying our floors. The final deciding factor in choosing Polish Guard was the sheen, or how glossy the floors would look when they were finished. I really had my heart set on a satin sheen. Just glossy enough to look like they're professionally sealed, but not so shiny and glossy that it becomes a maintenance nightmare showing every single footstep. The product information on Polish Guard said that it would give us a low sheen finish, but we would also have the option to follow up with a buffer, shining the floors all the way up to a high gloss. The manufacturer recommended that the product would be applied by a pump sprayer. Yep, the same kind you use to spray pesticide in your yard and then spread evenly over the concrete using a microfiber dust mop. We worked quickly and tried to maintain a wet edge. When we would need to take a break or refill the sprayer, we tried to use the relief cuts in the concrete as a breaking point. We followed the manufacturer's instructions and applied two coats of sealer to the floors. Most of the slab actually turned out really well, but there were a few conspicuous areas that turned out a little too glossy. It kind of looked like somebody had spilled cooking oil on the floor and had tried to mop it up. All right, secret confession time. Even though the product we used is recommended for a steel trowel finished concrete, which is what we have, the sheen is a lot more uneven than I was expecting. I knew right away that we're going to want to wax or maybe buff the floors to help even that sheen out. Knowing that, we decided to add a third coat of finish to the floor to make it a little bit thicker and prepare it for buffing. The floors already look much better with that third coat, much more even, and I feel really confident that with a little bit of floor polish or wax, we'll get it completely smooth and even. Thankfully, I absolutely love all the patterns and color variation of the natural concrete. They're super modern and organic looking, exactly what we were going for. So once we rent a floor buffer to even out the sheen and bring it down to that satin level that I wanted, I think I'm gonna be absolutely in love with them. While we're still in the Wayback Machine, we had one more step to protect our floors before the other trades came in. We've seen how rough construction workers can be on a job site. And we had worked way too hard on our sealed concrete floors to let them get destroyed with insulation and drywall. After allowing the polish guard to cure for 48 hours, we went around the entire house and taped off every single wall using blue painter's tape. We then pulled an all-nighter, installing roll after roll of ram board floor protection. Ramboard is a heavy duty paper product, almost closer to cardboard, and offers a lot more protection against scrapes and impacts versus regular flooring paper. Now fast forward four months into the future and you can see that the Ramboard had been used and abused. It was almost completely covered in spray foam insulation, joint compound, as well as paint, which Bryce and I are responsible for that one. When it was finally time to pull back the protective covering, I was more than a little nervous to see what we would have underneath. I'm happy to report that the RAM board did its job in protecting our floors very, very well. Despite having multiple trades and dozens of workers in the house, the sealed concrete floors still look as good as new. In fact, I know it's hard to tell because they're still pretty dusty in these shots, but I actually think some of that uneven sheen in the finish has evened out a bit.
To turn this concrete slab into finished floors for a family home, we needed to fill in all the expansion joints and relief cuts. We chose a super strong but flexible concrete repair adhesive by Quickcrete to fill the gaps. We applied the adhesive in a similar way to how you would apply grout, and fortunately, since it's water-based, it was easy to clean up the residue. You can see the adhesive looked a little light when it was first applied, but by the time it dried, it matched the concrete perfectly. If you take a little sneak peek to the back of our living room wall, you can see that our love for concrete didn't only extend to our floors. When we first discussed what we were going to cover our large 19 foot two story fireplace with, I knew I didn't want drywall. In a dream world with an unlimited budget, I would have chosen an industrial looking cast in place, dramatic full concrete fireplace. But in the real world with a realistic budget, I found the next best thing, concrete wall panels. I did some digging and I found out there's a company called Concreate that makes real concrete panels thin enough and light enough that you can mount them to the wall. The concrete panels can be attached to cement board, plywood, or even drywall. We liked the insulation properties of masonry, so we decided to first skin the entire fireplace using four by eight sheets of quarter inch cement board. Although it does require a special blade, cement board can be cut using a standard circular saw. For all the detailed cuts around outlets and light switches, we found it easiest to use an angle grinder with a diamond saw attachment. The large 4x8 sheets were nice because they covered so much square footage, but once we started working higher than we could reach on ladders, Bryce had to climb up the scaffolding, which meant I had to try to get the full sheets up all the way to him by myself. Watching the video, I realized it doesn't look very impressive, but that was actually really hard. Once the entire 19 foot tall fireplace was skinned, but before we added the decorative panels, we decided to do a test fit of the electrical fireplace insert that we we're going to use. And it's a good thing that we did. Turns out that the opening we had framed was about an inch and an eighth larger than it needed to be. Luckily, that was an easy fix with some leftover framing lumber. A few days before installation, our four foot by two foot concrete wall panels were delivered and we brought them in the house to allow them to acclimate to the temperature and humidity. Even though they're only a little over an eighth of an inch thick, they're made out of real concrete. So every single panel has its own unique look with subtle differences in color and patterns. We decided to try to get that perfectly imperfect look that we would pull panels alternating from three different boxes at a time. Since one panel wasn't long enough to reach all the way across the six foot six wide fireplace, we decided to embrace the slab look and put the seam directly down the middle. We measured as many panels as we could, but for anybody who's done a lot of home construction, you know that walls are never perfectly flat and straight. We got our best results when we held the panels in place, scribed a line with a pencil, and then followed that line with the circular saw. To attach the concrete panels to the cement board, we used construction adhesive that's designed to work with masonry. Similar to adding tile to the wall, we needed to make sure that our first row or course of panels was dead level. We ended up needing to shim and shave just a couple of spots to accommodate some imperfections in the floor. Once 
Once the first course was in place and the adhesive was dry, we felt confident to start building upwards. Bryce had a great idea to support the seam where the two panels met above the fireplace opening. Everywhere else, the weight of additional panels would push directly down on the panels beneath it. However, above the fireplace opening, there was nothing to support that stretch of panel. Bryce cut a small scrap of wood and screwed it to the underside of the framing of the opening, kind of creating a shelf that it could rest on in case extra weight tried to press it down. Shortly before starting on the fireplace, we invested in a $50 battery powered caulk gun from Ryobi, and it is my new favorite toy. I'll admit, it's totally not necessary, but when you're squeezing through 18 thick tubes of construction adhesive, you will be really glad you have it. You may notice that we used some blue painter's tape to help pull the corners of some of the panels together. Yeah, don't do that. That is not recommended by the manufacturer and it can actually damage the finish of the panels. Once the final concrete panels were attached to the fireplace, I don't know if we were more excited to have them on or to be able to be done with the scaffolding for good and be able to get it out of the living room. We tried to align factory edges of the panels together as often as we could. Most of our seams were really clean. There were just a couple of spots where we had a couple of tiny cracks. To help make the finish look just a little bit more flawless, we decided to use a concrete patch medium on some of the seams. We wiped away the excess, and once it was fully dry, we discovered that the concrete panels actually sand beautifully and it was easy to get a nice smooth edge. The last step was to address the raw edge where the concrete panels meet the white drywall behind it. Since the entire look of the fireplace is very sleek and minimal, I decided to be a little extra and actually put tape on either side of the caulk line. After applying the caulk and smoothing it with my finger, I could immediately pull the tape back and get a perfectly spaced even caulk line on all of my seams. The only thing that was left was to slide in and plug in our 60 inch wide electric fireplace insert. I don't know if the photos do it justice, but this thing is beautiful in person. Because the panels are real concrete, it has that same kind of soft velvety look like poured in place concrete has. I actually really like the seams. To me, it looks like the concrete was poured in lifts like it would be if this was a solid concrete fireplace. All right, I know. We're probably gonna get crap for using an electric fireplace. I know it's not a real fireplace, but we had some good reasons. One of the reasons being we, we would love to have a gas fireplace. In fact, we even had the gas run for our fireplace. It really was just cost prohibitive. So when our plumber came out, we made sure he ran a gas line. So we have, you know, the little key knob thing, whatever that's called, the valve. And so this is ready to go if we ever want to add a gas fireplace. But when we were doing our research, electric fireplaces were a fraction of the cost. The cheapest 60 inch gas fireplace that I could find was over $3,000 and a lot of them would go up, yeah. you know, five, six thousand dollars But we found this guy instead, which, you know, it's electric, but it was only $800. <laughs> We'll change it out down the road if we ever get the chance. I actually pretty like I like it. I, I think like it looks it pretty good. Yeah. Another great reason why the electric works so well here is because it is Arizona and it is hot most of the time, we can actually have the fire on without producing any heat. So we can experience that uh, sit by the fire without burning to death, even when it's July. All the fire, none of the heat. We did, however, choose an insert that does have a heat blower on it. It's basically like an electric heater. So those few cold days a year that we get here in the Phoenix area, we can turn it on and have hot air blow out, you know, similar to a real fireplace. The next project we moved on to was installing the interior doors. 
We had purchased eight foot tall, solid slab, hollow core pre-hung doors from a local door company. We had several interior doors to hang, so we decided to make our lives a lot easier and order the Door Stud Door Installation Toolkit. We chose the Pro Series, which came with two heavy duty all steel tools, which are kind of like roller skates for the door. Once the door stud tools were set up, I could connect them to the bottom edge of the door using the integrated toggle clamps. Then once the door was flipped upright, the door stud did the hard work for us, holding it perfectly in place vertically. It was then really easy to adjust the wheels and scoot the door over to the framed opening where it belonged. There's lots of really good instructional videos on how to hang a pre-hung door on YouTube, so I won't go over every step. I'm sure there's more than one way to skin a cat, but we followed the steps that Bryce learned when he was framing houses with his dad several years ago. Regardless of the technique, you always have to make a million little adjustments when you're hanging a door, which is really simple to do using the door stud. If the door wasn't lined up perfectly, all we had to do was to twist the knobs to bring the door either up and down or in or out. I'm really glad I had Bryce's help installing all of the interior doors, but I'm also happy to know that now I have a tool that makes it possible to hang pre-hung doors by myself. The door stud's also going to really come in handy down the road when we need to take the door slabs on and off the hinges for painting. Speaking of down the road, door casing came next to finish off these raw jams of the doors, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in future episodes. If you're looking at our doors and thinking flat slab hollow core interior doors belong on a 1980s mobile home, don't worry. You just got to have a little faith in my design. The doors will be painted in a high gloss white and the door casing that we chose has a simple but eye catching design that will bring it all together making the doors look finished and not too busy. Our fireplace. As I mentioned before, the electric fireplace insert cost $800. Well actually $799 with free shipping and no tax so a dollar under $800. We spent an additional $220 on the cement board backing as well as screws and some other incidentals. The total for all of the wall panels would have been a little over $3,600, but fortunately we were able to partner with Concreate and they sponsored the product so we ended up paying zero for the concrete wall panels on the fireplace. Altogether, our total expense for the two-story concrete fireplace was $1,019. That's only $19 over our estimated $1,000 budget. We had originally budgeted $12,500 for all of our interior and exterior doors, not including garage doors. Our 12-foot sliding glass door in the back of the living room cost $2,151, so about $2,100. In episode eight of our house building series, we talked about installing our full glass and steel front door from Pinky's Iron Doors. That door was $2,028. So all of the doors in our house, interior and exterior doors, came in around $11,400. We haven't had a whole lot of things come in under budget, so we're proud of that one. The budget for our floors is an interesting topic. We originally thought we were going to do a more traditional style flooring, and so when we were designing our house budget, we allowed ourselves $8,000 for flooring. Once we settled on sealed concrete and decided we were going to do the labor ourselves, we knew that was a place where we were going to potentially save thousands of dollars. And we did! We purchased all of the concrete sealer we needed for about $375. Additionally, we also bought a different type of sealer for our shop and garage floors, which we will install later, and that cost us $491. 
We spent a little over $300 for the RAM board, heavy paper floor covering, as well as tape and a few other things. So our floors in total only cost us $1,142. That's a full $6,800 under our $8,000 budget, which is definitely very, very exciting. But if you've watched a few of our past episodes, you will know that money has already been spent elsewhere. We were able to pay for the cost of the fireplace and our floors out of pocket, but our doors came out of our construction loan. So that puts our total borrowed from our construction loan a little over $205,000. And at this point, we have spent $39,500 or so out of pocket. We are doing pretty well on our budget right now, which we are trying to keep up. Coming up very shortly though, we have some great big expenses like our septic system and the rest of our HVAC. So make sure you're subscribed to the Pneumatic Attic channel so you can catch what's coming up in future episodes. We're getting really close, guys. If you want to get caught up on the rest of the Building Modern on a Budget series, check out this playlist. And if you like other types of DIY content, check out this video as well. I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking, so make sure you leave your questions in the comment section below. And as always, thanks for watching, guys.